Hello, this is our science teacher Tim Martin, and in this astronomy video, I want to go over a brief history of solar system astronomy. I'd also like to subtitle this after Isaac Newton's famous quote, that he saw further than others because he stood on the shoulder of giants. Maybe, after a few minutes, you'll understand his perspective of standing on the shoulders of the greats that came before. For starters, let's go back 2,500 years ago to the Greek mathematician Pythagoras. Of course, we know Pythagoras for dis developing the Pythagorean theorem, understanding the properties of right triangles, but it was Pythagoras who also established that the Earth was spherical. By watching numerous lunar eclipses and seeing the curved shadow of the Earth on the moon, he was able to deduce that the only shape that would always cause a round shadow is a sphere, thus the Earth must be spherical. Several hundred years later, Aristotle was the one that explained the phases of the moon, understanding that a sphere that's illuminated from one direction could go through the varying changes in shape and size. Aristotle also was the one to understand that the planets are more distant than the moon. We can see this quite easily telescopically now, such as this image I took in 2001 when Saturn passed behind the moon, or this one, which was taken in 2015, when the moon passed in front of the planet Venus. All of these observations fit the generally held idea of the time that we lived in a geocentric system. That is, the Earth is in the center, and surrounding the Earth and the air are crystal spheres. There were crystal spheres that contained the moon, sun, and the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These rotated around the Earth, causing day and night, the moon rise and set, and the various motion of the planets. 2,200 years ago, Eratosthenes came on the scene. Also one of the founders of geometry, he really understood the idea that geometry was measuring the Earth. He used some basic principles of sunlight and parallel lines and understanding that there was a well where the sun was directly overhead at one point during the year, and at where he was in Alexandria, Egypt, he saw shadows. And using these principles and basic geometry, he was able to not only understand that the Earth was spherical, but measure the distance around the Earth. Hipparchus is another important Greek mathematician and astronomer. Living around 2,150 years ago, he developed a number of important measuring tools. He's often given credit for the development of the astrolab and the armillary, the sphere that showed position of the stars, moon, and planets. His careful construction of tools to measure led to the creation of one of the best astronomical star maps of its day. As he worked on this, he also discovered precession the fact that the Earth's axis wobbles somewhat similar to a top. It's quite remarkable to think that his measurements were accurate enough to detect precession when the precession cycle takes 26,000 years. The geocentric model of the solar system did have problems, particularly when explaining one curious phenomenon. If one looks at the planets over the course of many nights, you'll see a progression across the sky. Except after a while, they seem to reverse in direction, but then reverse once again and continue on their previous journey. Describing the process of retrograde motion baffled many of the early scientists and astronomers. If the planets were in orbit around the Earth, how could they appear to back up? It wasn't until the astronomer Ptolemy came along and he figured that instead of the planets moving in a sphere or a circle around the Earth, that maybe they actually moved in a circle in a circle. These cycles on top of cycles would potentially explain the occasional backwards motion of the planets. So it was approximately in the year 150 when Ptolemy proposed this complex idea of epicycles to account for the retrograde motion of the planets as they moved around the Earth. This, of course, was incorrect, but these ideas lasted for over a thousand years. Nicholas Copernicus pro 
re-proposed the idea of the heliocentric model for the solar system. Basing some of his ideas on the ancient Greek Aristarchus, he thought it made more sense if the planets, in fact, moved around the sun rather than the planets and sun moving around the earth. Tycho Brahe was another very interesting person in the line of history. Was he an astronomer? Well, certainly he was an astrologer and an alchemist, an astrologer for the king of Denmark, and it, from the looks of his house, it appears that he was quite successful at his occupation. We also know he was a bit of a salty sort. You should read the story about how he lost his nose in a sword fight while arguing over who was a better mathematician. Regardless of his facial prosthetics, he may have been one of the best astronomical observers ever. He's known to have very keen eyesight, and he built outlandish instruments to measure the positions of the planets with outstanding precision. Of course, this was largely to cast more precise horoscopes. In order to calculate the positions of the sun and moon and planets, he came up with an even more complex system for the solar system. He correctly had the moon orbiting the earth and the planets orbiting the sun, but he still thought that the sun orbited the earth in this complex system of cycles. At the same time, an Italian astronomer, Galileo Galilei, had read of the invention of the telescope. Very keen on getting his hands on a telescope, he was impatient and he decided to build his own after a delay in the one he ordered. It turns out that the telescope he built was better than the one he had ordered, and as far as we know, he may have been the first to take the telescope and make observations with the sky. He discovered a number of things, including craters of the moon. He also discovered the moons of Jupiter. Here's a page from his journal where he, you can see on January 7th in the year 1610, he documented Jupiter and small star-like objects beside it. And over the course of the next nights, he noticed that these objects changed in position. It was not long before he figured out that these were actually moons orbiting the planet Jupiter. Galileo also observed that Venus underwent phases similar to our moon. He also noticed that both Venus and Mars changed in size depending on their location and their proximity around the Sun. These observations, while they did not prove the heliocentric model, they disproved the geocentric model of the solar system. There's no way to have a Mars changing in size and Venus changing in size, particularly going through different phases, if all of the planets went around the Earth at an equal distance. Johannes Kepler was a very astute mathematician. He was also interested in getting in on the fortune-telling business, so he knew he would do well being employed by Tycho. Using Tycho's very careful measurements, Kepler was able to explain the heliocentric model of the solar system with much greater accuracy and precision. From his work, he developed three basic laws of planetary motion. We'll come back to these in a minute. Kepler correctly predicted in 1631 that in the year 1639, Venus would pass in front of the sun, although he never observed this. The picture on the left is one I took when Venus transited the sun in 2012. It's highly unlikely you'll get a chance to see this because the next Venus transit of the sun will occur in the year 2117. It's much more likely that you'll be able to see a transit of Mercury. Mercury passes in front of the Sun every few years, with one coming up in 2019. These planetary transits were also important for the early astronomers who were estimating the size and distance of the Sun and the planets. Let's come back to Kepler's laws. Kepler's first law was that the planets travel around the Sun in an ellipse. While many at the time believed that the planets would travel in circles around the Sun, he found that the data actually fit better if he calculated the orbits to be the shape of an ellipse. The second is a little more complex, but can be summarized quite nicely when he realized that when planets were close to the Sun, 
or at perihelion, they appeared to be moving faster, and when they were further away, or at aphelion, they were moving at a slower rate within their orbit. The third observation that Kepler made was that the inner planets, or the planets that were closer to the Sun, orbited more rapidly in less time than the planets that were more distant. Of course, there were many mathematical implications for these, but these basic observations were very important. It was Isaac Newton who came after Kepler, and he developed the laws of gravity after studying Kepler's work. Newton understood the concept of inertia, that an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object will, in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by another force. He knew that the objects in motion would continue going in a straight line. But for an object to be in orbit around their sun, there must be some attractive force. By studying Kepler's work, he formulated the idea of this attractive force that he named gravity, and this is what kept planets in orbit around the sun. Of course, the basic ideas of gravity that Newton formulated 400 years ago are still in use today when we send rockets to the moon and Mars and distant reaches of the solar system. At this point, it's worth looking back to think that Isaac Newton was able to base his observations off of the work of Johannes Kepler, who was able to combine the work of Galileo and his teacher, Tycho Brahe, and he was able to base his work off of many of the earlier Greek mathematicians and scientists who had made careful observations understanding the basics of how our solar system works. Truly, Newton was able to see as far as he did by standing on the shoulders of giants. Thanks for watching, and I hope you join me again on another Earth Science video.